this is not an Atari ST. Despite its similarities, this is an Atari Falcon 030. It has a few modern enhancements under the hood, but it also has a few problems. And we're going to fix them right now. Mark fixes stuff. The whole machine is due a capacitor replacement. The wiring is untidy. Some of the keyboard keys don't work. And whilst the 3D printed back panel looks OK, the power connector has broken away. Let's strip this right down. Carefully unplugging the keyboard connector, I realise I forgot to unplug the mouse. Whoops. The fail keys are on a numeric keypad. Lurking inside we find a modern CT60E accelerator card, equipped with 512 megabytes of RAM and a 100 megahertz capable processor. Over to the right we find even more memory in the guise of a 14 megabyte system RAM expansion. Our old Atari and friends best electronics are mentioned here on the huge 4 gigabyte compact flash card. This cardboard is very rustic, I like it. Ok, let's get the rest of this apart. There are a few tabs to twiddle on this metal shielding. It's easier to take the CT60E board out first, pulling it evenly upwards, gently but firmly, to release the three connectors underneath. Next we can wrangle this 3D printed switch bracket out and the accelerator board and Pico PSU assembly come free. The top shielding easily lifts off now. Inside we find some top drawer electrical insulation. It seems to be over the top of this early clock buffer mod. This is an RTC with a built in battery. They're all flat these days. We'll remove it and put a socket in. The 14 megabyte system RAM board also comes off by pulling evenly upwards. These are very simple and not much to look at really. The fan is disgusting and will be cleaned. Let's take the drive cradle out. The compact flash adapter simply unplugs from the cable and can be set aside. Next we'll be able to remove the board and lower shielding from the case. Making sure nothing is catching on the board, we next separate the main board from the lower shield. Atari cardboard, as usual marked with a revision number. Classic. It's cleaning time. I'm grabbing my anti-static brush. And let's remove the fan. Its nuts have finally dropped. Using the brush we get to cleaning off the filth. The whole machine is dirtier than a swinger's diary. Let's use my magic finger blast and... The Falcon seems to have some rather pointless foam stuck to its mainboard. I'm trying to pull it off, but it's just refusing to come. A soak in an IPA will break down the adhesive. But sometimes you need to use a blunt tool to work the liquid into the foam. Once you've penetrated it, the foam goes soft and moist, 
and you can finish it off with your fingers. A final clean of the area. Much better. The fan has been cleaned, polished and remounted in the board. It no longer grinds when I move it with my fingers. Right, let's get on to that recap. I have a list here. I'm not going to film every capacitor change. But I will show the odd cases, like this capacitor here. Using the desoldering gun, it's simple to remove the old parts. During 2020, capacitor stocks are low, so I had to use alternate brands, a mix of Vichy and Illinois capacitors, which I find to be really good. This is an odd one for me though, and I'm not sure which way round it should go. I think this line is denoting positive, like the ring on other caps. The internet is not much help, so let's pop it in and see what happens. I had to stop and film this old capacitor. Wangs. <laughs> a little way into the process, I discovered that the thick ground plane of the Falcon really needs a high temperature to take solder well. I usually use 330 degrees centigrade. I also employed a lot of lovely flux. It's worth showing this larger capacitor going in at the higher temperature. It's a good idea to work quickly. This is no clean flux, but I can't help myself. Look out for C117, the only radial cap on the board. Next, let's remove and replicate this mess. I'm not even sure what it does. Some kind of AB quality mod as an afterthought. We'll replace it all with new. With the caps gone, we can clean the board. Let's zoom through the easy bit. I hope you're enjoying this video. They take a lot of time, effort and funds to produce. If you're able to help me in making even more videos, then you can become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash stuff and you'll also get some exclusive Patreon perks. Offering up the clutch connector to the RF box, we can see where we need to attach the lead and bend it to fit. In this case, it'll be easier to clip the lead before soldering. I'm going to solder the top point into position and then I can work out the best way to solder the other lead. This looks like it'll produce a strong joint. some flux, and then we can solder them together. That's not going anywhere. With the whole board recapped, I'm going to give it a test. Best to troubleshoot any issues now, and also check out the mystery first capacitor, which I'm starting to suspect may be wrong. We won't bother with the case to make connecting everything up a bit easier. I'm taking real care to make sure everything is connected. We'll want to see if the machine boots properly, so we're attaching the compact flash drive. And of course the mouse and keyboard. We're using a modern VGA monitor adapter for the best image. 
It's by Daniel Hedberg of New Beat. Just making sure everything is safe and not shorting anything out. I've got an old 1024x768 Dell monitor here to use. Connecting the power to the Pico PSU. And nothing. I bet it's this capacitor. Let's turn it around. Of course that's the right way. What was I thinking? A deep breath. And the machine springs to life. The accelerator card is only running at 66 MHz though. I think it's lost its settings. No worries. Let's fire up a demo. After leaving the machine on for an hour it was still running fine so let's do the other repairs. The wiring is very flaky here. The power switch and CT60 toggle switch are simply twisted onto the terminals. At the other end are DuPont style headers. So we'll fix this and neaten them up as well. The battery backed RTC clock is confirmed as flat, but a new one is coming in a few days. These screws are a bit manky as well, they'll have to go. But first, let's sort out the most important issue the broken keyboard. It has about 50 screws holding it together. These domes contain the contacts for the keyboard matrix, so I don't want to lose any. I can see the problem already. This section of the keyboard has corroded traces, possibly a small spill. The traces corrode and then become either highly resistive or open circuit. The track is actually flaking off. Let's pop these domes back so I don't lose them. Continuity is very hit and miss here. From here to here I have a good connection with little resistance. These tracks show high resistances. Even from here to here there's no circuit. I'm going to scrape back the lacquer until I find a good section of fresh copper. I know the connection is good down here as well. I need to bridge these poor connections and I have a couple of new ways to try. When we apply some isopropyl alcohol to the traces to clean them, it reveals the actual track corrosion in full. The darker patches are the oxidized copper. The next trace is revealed and it has the same issue. The circuit is broken as soon as I move the probes onto the damaged part of the track. I'm going to go ahead and remove the lacquer on the remaining damaged traces. A quick clean up and then let's decide how to fix this.
I've got some syringes of silver paint for PCB repair. It was quite cheap from China, but I'm not sure how well it works. Using polyamide tape, I'm masking off the board to get some nice straight lines. Here goes nothing. I'm using a small brush to get into the track. Peeling off the tape is very satisfying. But I went a bit crazy there. Hmm, no continuity at all. The internet says that it needs to be applied in layers, so let's layer it some more. The internet also says it needs to be dried with heat to cure it. Well, it's definitely dry. And it's turned into a kind of a rubbery plastic consistency. But it doesn't seem to conduct electricity at all. Rubbish. Let's get this gunk off of the track. I tried curing some for an hour under a warm UV light, but again no continuity even when the probes almost touch. Next up, conductive carbon paint. Well, once bitten and twice shy, I'm going to test this before using it on the actual keyboard. Popping some generous gloops on the plastic sheet, and then drying thoroughly with a 50 degree hot air wand. My hopes for this one. Let's test. Hmm, nothing here. As I get closer I start to see a connection, but the resistance is quite high and not suitable for the keyboard. The paint also starts to flake off with moderate touching, and I quite enjoy moderate touching. Stuff this and let's go old school. Enamel wire. I'm just going to tin the good end of the tracks and jumper them with this fine wire. If you were of a mind to, you could flux the entire wire and solder it down to the damaged track, but I don't want to make the repair too thick in case it affects reassembly. Testing with the meter and continuity to all points is now perfect. Let's quickly do the other tracks. More checking shows that these tracks are now working great. Let's get them insulated. I'm using polyamide tape again. Some people might like to use a fresh lacquer coat, but those can contain volatile organic compounds that might attack the rubber cups in the keyboard. It's best to be safe. Although the number keys were the only part of the keyboard affected, I found another area of damage in the center. Whilst the keyboard is apart, let's fix that too. Checking with the meter now shows almost zero resistance. Just to show you the scale of these repairs, here's a rule. I've checked the whole board over and these seem to be the only problems. I'm confident that the keyboard will be fine now. Putting the keyboard back together and we've done the major work on the Falcon. And it's going great so far.
mustn't forget this bit. Now that switch panel. I've renewed the wiring having cut it to a better length and pre-tinned the ends. We'll solder them to the switches first, remembering to slip on some pre-cut heat shrink sleeving to make a really neat job. All standard stuff here. I'm shrinking the tubing at about 100 degrees Celsius. These look a lot better, I hope you'll agree. This thick cable for the Pico PSU is far too long. It's a massive 12 incher. Just popping the Pico into place so I can see a rough length for the cable. About there will be fine. This 12 incher is getting the snip. We'll desolder these. I always pre tin wires because it makes working on the board easier. I soldered the wires into the board from the other side, because that's where they'll be fed from and there isn't much clearance in the case. Then the first layer of heat shrink. The whole cable has this coating of stranded fiber. It can't be cut very neatly in my experience, so that gets a heat sleeving as well. To deal with the problem of the broken socket, I'm going to use a dual component resin adhesive. This will dry clear and cure into a firm bond with slightly elastic properties. I'm liberally coating the socket. And now I just draw it backwards into place. While still wet, I wipe off any excess drips. This should be very strong when dry. This RTC is doing nothing because the battery is dead inside it. Let's take it out and whip a socket in instead for when the new one arrives. I'm adding fresh solder to help the desolder gun get a good suck. That was pretty easy. I'm not going to waste this because you can hack a new battery into them. It's just in here under some soft plastic. I don't have a socket to fit, so I'm just going to modify this one. Hurrah, the new RTC arrived. Although the legs are suspiciously quite bent. Boo, it's a system pull and doesn't work. Never mind. Now our switch panel is ready, we can rebuild the machine. The wiring is so much tidier. Speaking of tidy, we have four new shiny screws for the fan. Much better looking, and that socket isn't going anywhere. I've tested every key and they work. The machine boots great, but the RTC issue is eating at me. The new one is also flat, so rather than the lottery of ordering from another seller, I've modified the original. 
Inside these are pretty much a standard RTC chip with a small amount of SRAM. Mounted on top of that is a crystal and a single use battery which is then covered in some heavy potting and encapsulated in a plastic case. I've fitted a battery holder onto this for easy changes in the future. I've resoldered the crystal to the correct legs. With the holder on top it was too close to the shielding so I've reorientated it to the side and insulated it with more polyamide tape. This works great now and some future proofing because the RTC chips are no longer made. Before we close up the case let's put a bit of double sided sticky foam under that compact flash adapter to keep it secure. Ok done. Phew. This machine is one bad bird. Let's finally test it properly. I want to see how it performs in stock 66 MHz mode on a 90s classic. Quake. The answer is amazingly. Back when Quaker was released, I would have been over the moon if the PC that I had at the time had run it nearly this well. Ok this is giving me all the feels again. Let's go back to that demo and see how 100MHz runs. Much to my shame I don't know much about the Falcon and its software. Atari hoped that the Falcon would go head to head with the emerging PC market. It might seem crazy now, but looking at the capabilities on display here, albeit enhanced, you can really see where their ambitions came from. Obviously I have to be a bit careful when playing music from demos, it might be copyrighted, but I have been told to mention the advanced audio capabilities of the Falcon. And one of my patrons said, please mention that the Amiga didn't have any MIDI ports. A big thanks to Richard for allowing me to play with his Falcon. And a big thanks to my amazing Patreons who make my videos possible. You can join them at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fixes Stuff. I hope you enjoyed this video, maybe you'd like to watch another. Here, I'll put some on the screen for you. Bye.